This is the third video on Introduction to Feedback. This video focuses on how we might implement feedback loops in practice. So first some background. We're going to assume that students are familiar with the weaknesses of open loop control. That was covered in video one. And also that students understand how humans ensure that systems behave the way we want by using an iterative procedure of monitor and adjust. This video is going to look at how we replicate the human procedures and monitor adjust using some form of automation to replace the human in the loop. Let's remind ourselves then of the key points. So how would a human control the temperature in a shower? So let's do a little schematic just so we can see what the human is actually doing. So there we go. There's our human. And what they're going to do is they're going to have some form of hand there it is, which monitors the flow of water. So what I'm going to do is put a tap there and then coming down here, perhaps I should use red, this can be the hot flow and then you might have cold flow coming in via the tap and then the water comes out and so the human, they put their hand in the flow and they say, okay, what temperature is that flow? I can feel it. So that's how they monitor. And then what they'll do is they'll use their other hand, probably, to turn the tap. So you can see we've got one hand monitoring the temperature and the other hand turning the tap. And how much do we turn the tap? Well, that information is coming from the brain. And in the brain, you're going to have some form of desired temperature. Right, how are we going to automate that? Well, you'll remember in the previous video, we gave an indication of how we might represent that in a simplified form. So we have the desired temperature coming in, we have the actual temperature coming in, and then we've got some form of computation going on. I'm going to put a question mark there in a minute. Out of that is going to come tap position. So that algorithm, whatever it is, is going to tell us where the tap should be. That's going to go into the shower unit. And out of the shower unit, we get a temperature, which we feed back. And that goes in there. So there's our feedback path. So you see we've got the desired temperature and the actual temperature going into some box. We've got a question mark in it. That box decides where the tap should be. So that tap affects the shower and we get a different temperature coming out. Now, in general, the tap position is going to be something like a function of the desired temperature plus another function of the actual temperature. And the problem that we're going to uh, set ourselves in the later videos is how do we define this function f? How do we define this function g? What about controlling the speed of a car then? Well, again, we can do a very simple schematic to show roughly what's going on. So again, if I do my little head, there it is. So there's our man. Oh, his eye's in the wrong place there, isn't it? We can have two eyes. So what's this man going to be doing? He's going to be looking at the speedo, and the speedo might have some different speeds on it. There we go, 10, 14, 70. So the man's going to be looking, or could be a woman indeed, looking at the speedo, saying what's the actual speed. They'll have an idea of the desired speed VD and based upon that they're going to make some form of decision. What will they do with that decision? They will say right I need to move my leg. My leg is on the accelerator which can move up and down. So you'll see they monitor the speed, they compare it with the desired speed and based on that they'll move their foot up and down. So how do we represent this in a schematic if something that's automated? Well, it'll be a bit like the previous page. We will have a box. Here I'll put a question mark in. Into this box will come the desired speed and the actual speed. The box will say, right, this is the pedal position that I actually want. That pedal position will go into the car and out comes the actual velocity and we feed back that velocity this way. So the only question then is how do we determine this pedal position? Well it's going to be something like pedal equals, forgot the D there, some function of the 
desired velocity plus some function of the actual velocity. And our problem is going to be how do we determine this f and how do we determine this g? But you'll notice we've gone from a sort of realistic environment with a human in the loop and we've represented it with some form of block diagram which is a bit easier to understand to represent the key actions in the process. So now we're going to look at a heat exchanger. Now in the previous examples were somewhat simplified as they ignored the actuation and this slide is going to give pretty much all the details of a real feedback loop showing all the different components and then the later slides will gradually simplify that to something we can analyse. So let's start then. Now I'm going to use the pen to illustrate the bits I'm talking at because this slide is quite busy and otherwise you're going to get lost. So first of all let's look at the process itself. So here we go, it's a heat exchanger and you'll see I'm drawing a line around it. So this bit at the top. So this is the process. Now what's going on in this process? You'll see I've got hot stream coming out and a, as an input and a cooled stream as the output and my job is to get the right temperature on this cooled stream. Now how do I um, change the temperature? Then you'll notice that there's cold coming in and going out. So basically the hot stream comes through this heat exchanger and depending on the flow of cold water going around the outside of the heat exchanger I can affect the temperature of the output T. So the question is all right how do I affect this cold flow going through here? How do I affect the, the flow rate coming here? And you'll see if I now draw a red line round the actuation. So here we go. We've got an actuator. I'm using this red circle or red loop to show you what's going on. You'll see I've got a control valve. Essentially that's a bit like a tap. It's something that I can turn and as I turn it affects the flow rate of cooling water going through the heat exchanger. Now how does this control valve actually turn? Well what you'll notice is in this particular case it's turned by an air supply some high pressure air and that's affected by some input signal U here. It doesn't really matter these fine details but the key thing is we've got a signal coming in and that signal affects the flow rate of the cooling water. So that's the actuation. Alright, next question then is what's the actual temperature of the outflow T? So I'm going to use a different colour here. I'll use black to show the loop of what we're going on. Oh, sorry. I'm in black, not red. So we've got another loop, another component rather, here. You can see what's going on. And this component is the measurement. You'll see there's a thermocouple. So the thermocouple is put on the output stream and that measures the temperature of the output flow. And the, the temperature is measured and it's turned into millivolts or, or a current, some sort of electrical signal that we can do something with. So finally then, what do we do here? So you'll see we've got the process in the blue circle, we've got the actuation in the red, and we've got the measurement in the black. So what happens next? I'll use some red arrows. You'll see the measurement comes along here. So there's our measurement, comes along here. And then you'll see we have a target at the bottom, and these two come into a box, which is our feedback law and that feedback law sends a signal to the actuator. So you'll see it's pretty much what we had on the previous slides but it's showing that in practice there could be far more components or many more components involved in this process. Now this is quite complicated so what we want to do now is simplify this to something that's easier to deal with. So what have I done here? I've taken out all of the sketches of the actual items and replaced them by boxes. So first of all I'm going to replace the heat exchanger itself by this box here which says process. So coming into the process I have some that's the, going to be the cold flow that you can choose and coming out that's the temperature that uh, the temperature of the outflow that I'm interested in. Now what happens with the temperature of the outflow? You see it comes down here and it goes through the measuring element. So there's the dynamics of the measuring element and that provides a signal okay, which tells me what the measured output is. And so you might put something like TM 
for measured output, whereas you could have something like T here. Now what, what happens next, and this is the bit that um, is a subtle change. I'm going to put a dotted red line around some bits here where it says controller mechanism. Now what you have to understand is that dotted red line represents the box which we've used in the past, which has got the measured output and the set point coming into it. But here we're going to do a simplification which won't necessarily happen in the human brain. We're going to assume that first the set point and the measured output are subtracted one from another. So if I call this set point R, then what we're going to do is generate a signal E equals R minus TM. So we're going to say what's the difference between the target and the actual output? And that's what this summing junction does. And it gives me an error signal coming out. And that error signal is then going to go into a box, which here we've called the controller. And that's going to give you the actuation. That's going to say, what do I want the actuator to do? So you'll notice in this dotted red line, it's, it's a bit more prescriptive than the generic box. So whereas before we had something like P equals F of R minus G of TM. So we said there could be, um, so I plus G of TM, there could be one function on the set point and another function on the measured output. What we're going to do now is say, no, we're going to use a slightly simplified form where we're going to say we have some function of R minus TM. So in other words, we're forcing F and G to be the same function. And that's fairly generic, and you'll find most control loops do that. What do we do then with the output of this control? This goes into the actuation. So this final box here, this is the um, dynamics of the actuation, and that produces the cold flow rate. Now, this particular diagram has also said in practice there could be some disturbance entering the system. We're not going to bother about that in these particular videos. It's important to know about it later, but we don't want that complication. Next simplification then. If you look at the previous diagram, you'll notice that we had the control element, which we can represent with a block K of S. We had the dynamics of the actuation, which we can represent with the box G V of S. We had the dynamics of the process, which we can represent with GP of S, and the dynamics of the sensor, which we can represent with H of S. And we had this summing junction, which found the difference between the target and the output. And you'll see now we have a block diagram, which is a lot easier to interpret um, and therefore easier to analyze. And we're now going to simplify things a little bit more, because in practice what people do is they draw a block diagram around the actuation and the process and they do something like G equals GV times GP and consider it as a single element, i.e. they absorb the dynamics of the actuation into the process and consider it a single dynamic. And the other thing we're going to do is we're going to assume here that H equals 1 because usually any dynamics in the sensor are so fast as to be insignificant compared to the other dynamics in the loop and therefore can be ignored. So what do we end up with? We end up with a loop like this. So you'll see the M. This is your control law. This is what you've got to choose. And G, which you'll remember was this GV times GP. And you'll know the H term has been removed because it was H equals 1. So if I put in this block diagram what we had before, and you'll see we've simplified the diagram which had four blocks and now we're representing it as having only two blocks. And this is fairly classical, but what you need to remember is that even if the block diagrams are represented just as having a control law M and a process G, in practice if you zoom in you'll see G comprises a few more bits and M comprises a few more bits. There's more going on, but in terms of the analysis it's a lot easier if we simplify it down to this form. So working with block diagrams. So students are advised to look at the videos on analyzing block diagrams. There's a whole set of those and the dependencies on signals within these diagrams. And this video is only going to give a summary of block diagram algebra for the simple case because the details are given in other videos. So first, open loop, no feedback. What did we assume? We assumed we had a target R, which came into some sort of inverse model, which you estimated, and that was N. And that generated an input with integer g, and that gave you y. 
So that was the sort of block diagram you got if you had open loop. And you remember we showed in the first video that that really does not work. If we introduce feedback, you'll notice it's a very different sort of block diagram because now we've got this feedback path here. And this feedback path really makes a huge difference to the behaviours. And if you now look at the relationship between Y and R, you'll see I've got this transfer function GM over 1 plus GM. And that doesn't look a bit like GN. You'll see it's a very, very different transfer function. So introducing feedback has a substantial impact on the sort of dynamics we're going to get between the target and the output. We've got GM over 1 plus GM instead of just G times N. So some observations. Feedback changes behavior. However, this can be both for better or worse. There's a need for systematic design of EverMess to ensure that the resulting behavior is better. So there you can see GN might be relatively safe. This open loop behavior might not give me what I want, but it could be safe. However, as soon as I close the loop and introduce this feedback and get GM over 1 plus GM, it's quite possible the behavior I get is awful, especially if there's a bad design for M. So I need to make sure that I've got systematic approaches to choosing M, which ensure that what I get is good. And that's a theme which will be developed in the future videos. So conclusions. Automated feedback system requires four main components. You need a sensor to observe the output. You need a comparator which compares the output with the target, and that's often called a summing junction. You need an intelligent component which needs to decide what the new input should be. And in practice, the comparator is embedded within this, but usually we represent it just as a, the error signal going into some transfer function, K of S. So the intelligent component is usually reduced to a simple transfer function, K of S. And finally, we need an actuator or something similar to implement the desired input on the process. In practice, these components can be represented efficiently and transparently with a block diagram. And you'll notice we reduced it to a very simple form of block diagram. So students might wish to look at the videos on analyzing block diagrams before they continue with this set of videos.